reviewing more for the exam. So <laughs> electricity and magnetism and optics. We've already done some electricity, right? I, of course, started here because I forgot how far we'd gone. This is where we need to continue. So electric circuits. We have electric potential, which is the electric potential energy per unit charge. So as we have charge going through an electric circuit, we first have to have the definition of circuit has to have a path that comes back on itself. If it doesn't come back on itself, you don't have a circuit. You're not going to do circuit analysis. Then we have what was noted by, excuse me, Georg Ohm, that the energy per charge drop when, ch when charge goes through something is often proportional to the rate at which charge is going through. Now, what do we call the energy per unit charge? Charge is Coulomb. Energy per unit charge would be joules per Coulomb. What do we call that? The electric potential or the voltage. And what do we call the rate at which charge is passing? Current. Current, the number of coulombs per second. And then he said those are proportional, so we just have a constant proportionality that we call the resistance. So we have Ohm's law here. Hello, Leslie. Ohm's law V equals IR, it only applies to some materials. You can't apply that to everything. For instance, if you try to apply that to a battery, you're just going to get garbage. If you try to apply it to a, a diode or a transistor, you're going to get garbage. So we call things that applies to resistive materials. And remember our sign convention, current is the direction of positive charge flow. What's really flowing? Electrons and electrons have a negative charge, so the, the charge flow is actually opposite direction of the current. But when we draw that current arrow, then we put the positive at the tail end, the minus at the head end. So this equation V equals IR is the voltage difference from one side to the other side of the resistor, and it's equal to the current going through times the resistance. So we've done a lot with that, but it's important to remember what it stands for and how we use it. Then we had power dissipated. Well, power dissipated is going to be the energy change per charge multiplied by the charge per second. I mean, that's just it's power is energy per time. And so energy per charge times charge per second is going to give you the energy per time. But the energy per charge is V, and the charge per second is I. So power is VI. Now, if you have a resistor, you can use Ohm's law to get this in terms of, you know, powers V squared over R or I squared times R. But that's only if you have a resistor. Once again, if you try to use the power is equal to I squared R on a power supply, then you're like, well, what's the resistance of the power supply? And you end up in a failed state because it doesn't have a defined resistance. Electric hazards, always important. What is the lowest, well, first of all, do we measure in current or voltage that you tell us what you can feel? In current. So what's the lowest current roughly that you can feel? About one milliamp. It says that. It says all of them, actually. You can start to feel it about one. You start to have involuntary muscular contractions at around 10 milliamps. And then by the time you get to about 75 milliamps across the heart, your heart will start doing its own thing. And that's bad. And so there's multiple ways you can die, but a current under 10 milliamps is not going to be one of them. But once you get to 10 milliamps, if you have it across your chest, you can make it so your chest ties up and you can't breathe. And you can actually suffocate secondary to electric shock if it's sustained. So if you just touch something like this, and it has a high voltage, and you have a path through the ground so it makes current flow through you, it makes your muscles contract, and you go like this, and you slap yourself, and you say, well, I was stupid. 
But if you go like this, make your muscles contract and you can hold on to it, and that could cause you to be in a permanent state of I have muscles are contracted, I can't breathe, and you can suffocate. So, you know, safety things. If there's no way in the world to know if this is safe or not, except for touching it, I can't imagine where this comes up. It just, you know, you always want to go this way, not this way. Touch with the back of your hand so you can't. You can track. Unless your hand is good. Yes. All of the tendons this way have been ruptured, and my flexibility is incredible the other way. <laughs> All right. EKGs and ECGs. Well, an ECG. ECG and EKG are the same thing. EKG, that's the German version. ECG, that's the American version. The C is cardio. It's just they spell cardio with a K and we spell with a C. So electrocardiogram, you are putting probes to see what the current is across the well, voltage differences across the heart. So you measure voltage here and here. And of course, you don't have to know for this class, but if you're an EMT, anybody here, IRR, you have wine on the right, smoke over fire, right? And remember how to put those leads on. And you're measuring the voltage differences so you can see what's going on with the heart. And you should know those fundamental things about the cardiac rhythm. You should know. Ooh, that, you should know that that was wrong. Only the normal sinus rhythm. So you start with the P wave here. And what's going on with the P wave? Depolarization of the atrium is exactly right. That means the atrium had the signal to go. The muscles are contracting. The depolarization is what causes the muscles to contract. So the atria are pumping blood into the, into the ventricles. Then this here is combined as one thing. What's that one thing? The QRS complex. Yeah, QRS thing. <laughs> What's going on with the QRS complex? There's two things going on. The ventricle depolarizes and the atrium are repolarizing. Right. Ventricles are depolarizing, so the ventricles are pumping blood. That's the big pump, which is why it's a huge signal. And the atria are depol or repolarizing. They're returning to action. They're getting ready to go again. And then finally, what's this last wave? Okay, the T wave is the ventricle repolarizing. Now, like there, there's also more waves. You know, there's a, a U and a V and, and other stuff. But those are the primary ones that we see at a normal sinus rhythm. And normal sinus is the only one we analyze because we're not a biology class. But we want to understand the interpretation thereof. Now, I have here also EEG. EEG stands for electroencephalogram. That's when you put the probes on the melon. And they're measuring currents there because our whole bodies are running on electricity. The way I can remember things and the way I can put thoughts together is through electrical interactions in my brain. And so by using probes and measuring the voltages at different places on the skull, we can derive some information about what's going on inside, which I find pretty incredible. I also find it painful because they have to have good contact. And so at least when I had this done, it was for a psychology experiment. They basically do a little grinding to make sure you have good contact there. That wasn't comfortable at all. Okay. Um, circuits. In circuits, remember very important Kirchhoff's laws. Kirchhoff's voltage law basically says the energy, remember voltage is energy per charge, can't be created or destroyed and has some of the voltages on a loop equals zero. So if you go around a loop, the rises minus the drops is zero. Or why well, I say minus is rise, minus the drops if you're using absolute values for everything. There's different ways of writing it. You write it how you feel comfortable. If you write it correctly, you're going to get the same result. Kirchhoff's current law, do I have another... Yeah, you know, that's a bright, shiny color. 
says the charge can't be created or destroyed. So on a node, the sum of the currents is zero. So a node, that's a place where two or more elements come together. In practice, we only apply this to a, an essential node where three or more come together. Why? Because it's trivial. If you have two things coming together, what goes in goes out. Three nodes, you at least have something mathematical, but still what goes in comes out. So the sum of the currents in equals the sum of the currents out is another way this is written. I write it like this, currents in I put as positive, currents out I put as negative. Using these two equations plus the ever-important Ohm's law, well, that didn't change colors, but it's okay, we solve our, current, our circuit problems. So you should be able to go through and solve circuit problems. You should be able to find your equations just like before. You're not going to need to solve the equations once you've found them. You'll be great on finding them. Um, what does EMF stand for? It does in some cases, but not in this case. Electromotive force. Electromotive force is a, it's a misnomer. It's an anachronistic. <laughs> it was thought that a battery is putting a force on charges to move them through. Understanding batteries better, no, it's a chemical reaction occurring here, occurring here. And we still use that term EMF to tell us what the voltage difference is for the battery. The voltage difference from one terminal to the other. Because batteries are chemical reactions, the chemical reaction has a rate. Right? It's not going to go to infinite speed, which means that if you're using a lot of power, the voltage is going to drop because the reaction can't keep up. And so we model that by saying that a real battery equivalent. In in both cases, I'm going to change it to an ideal cell, even though cells don't give you these kind of voltages, just so it looks different. So the terminal voltage is measured between these points, and as current flows, you're going to have a voltage drop on this internal resistance, so that the terminal voltage drops as current flows. Now, if you have a good battery, this internal resistance should be a really small number. But if the battery is getting old, so the chemical reaction is very inefficient, then that internal resistance number will be growing. So to test the battery to see if it's good, you don't just measure the terminal voltage. If the terminal voltage isn't right when it's not being used, it's not just a bad battery, it's a broken battery. But when you use it, if the voltage drops precipitously, then it's a bad battery. If the voltage stays almost the same when you use it, it's a good battery. So the typical way of measuring to see if a battery is good or not is to have, here's our battery. I'm going to put the internal resistor there. E for the EMF. And then we connect something across it that has a resistor that's going to get hot. And then we do something like we put on top of that resistor a, I should have made it a horizontal resistor. We put a color reactive polymer. The same thing that mood rings are made of. And the more current you have flowing, the hotter this gets, and the more this color changes. And so, you know, if it changes to yellow, it got really warm, and you know, that's a good battery. If it changes to green, got a little warm. If it doesn't change at all, or if it's you know blue, I think is the next cooler color on that um, polymer. Then you're like, ooh, this is not really being able to keep up with the current it should be producing. Um, voltmeters. What's the ideal resistance for? A, well, first of all, how do you use a voltmeter? If I want to measure the voltage. I'm going to make – if I wanted to measure the voltage of just resist, across just resistor 2, how do I connect my voltmeter? That is correct. 
volt meter, I just put a V with a circle around, say, hey, here's my meter. And I go like that. So that's measured in parallel. Parallel because the top and bottom are the same place. So if I put this voltage meter in parallel, what should the resistor, resistance be if it's not going to change my circuit significantly? Can you repeat that again? Yeah. If I put my gold meter parallel like that, what should its resistance be if it's not going to change the current going through my circuit? Zero. If it's zero, I'm going to have a short circuit. And I'm going to have, instead of having to go through this resistor, it just goes through zero. And so I'm going to have a lot more current. So it's not zero. It has an eight, a lazy eight. Yeah, infinity. Ideally, we'd have an infinite resistance here. That way, there's no current that flows through. You remember that? That way, there's no current flowing through here, so the circuit remains unchanged. So voltmeters have very large resistances for that reason. Now, if I want to measure the current, I'll just put my current meter here, circle with the A in it for current, How? what kind of resistance does that have to have that's not going to affect the circuit? What, how do we say that's connected? Connected in, not parallel now, but in... So for that not to connect my circuit, what does its impedance need to be? I use impedance, it's still accurate. What should that be to not affect my circuit? Trace, you should be on this. I say that as a hint. Yeah. Wasn't a good one. <laughs> it's what you said before. Oh, it's zero. I mean one. Zero. If, if you had, no, that's what you said the first time on this. No, that was DJ. Oh, it was DJ? Oh, my bad. My bad. Okay, so, so you'd want a zero resistance for the ammeter so it doesn't affect the circuit. If I have a resistance that's bigger than zero, then it's going to make it a bigger resistance that the current has to go through so the current's going to drop. That's why we have to be careful with our ammeter, or you will put too much current through the ammeter. You know, if you connect the ammeter in parallel instead of in series, you have too much current go through it and burn something. And so we put a fuse in there so that it will burn the fuse instead of burning something valuable. And only if you're an absolute idiot, like apparently the people who made the voltmeters we have, the multimeters, do you make it so you have to remove about eight screws to get to that fuse that you change? Yes, in a very tough hey, Have you done it? Or do you have one like that? Yeah, it's a real pain. Okay, transient circuits. Transients, people who don't have a home, right? Transient circuits are circuits that don't have a home. They're in transit between one state and another state. And so we had two different types of transient circuits, ones that had a capacitor and ones that had an inductor. Excuse me. Um. RL or RC, not RLC. <laughs> so you have something like a power supply. Whoop, that's a capacitor. Power supply, a switch, a capacitor, a resistor. Um, <laughs> this would be a kind of dumb circuit. At time equals zero, you've got nothing. You close it, you're initially going to have a lot of current that flows until the voltage across that capacitor is equal to the voltage of the power supply. At that point, no current flows anymore. But understanding how that works, initially, the voltage across this was zero. And this here had whatever its EMF is. And since there's no current, the voltage here was zero. 
when I throw the switch, the capacitor's voltage can't jump because the capacitor had the relationship that we learned about, well, we learned about reviewed last class period that said capacitance is equal to Q over V or Q equals VC or V is equal to Q over C. Those are all accurate, right? So if it was uncharged, the voltage across it was zero. And thus, it's going to stay at zero initially until you get charge on there. And so if you have zero voltage across the capacitor, but you have the EMF on the battery and you have current flowing, you're going to have to have a voltage across the resistor that's equal to voltage across this initially. Which means the current through here is going to be I is equal to this voltage divided by this resistance. But when current flows, you start charging this up. As this charges up, as charge increases, its voltage increases, which means the voltage here decreases, which means the current's going to have to decrease. And so you have the voltage versus time graph for this. Okay, so here is time equals zero. It's going to go like that, where it asymptotes to the EMF. And if I did current versus time, here's time equals zero. goes like that. And the equation for these are where tau is equal to RC. So I said V infinity minus V zero. V infinity is the voltage it's going to have after a very long time. In this circuit, I look at, I analyze, say, after a very long time, this voltage will be here. So that's the EMF is V infinity. And then I have the V0 is the voltage this had right after I flipped the switch, which was zero. So it simplifies here very quickly to EMF minus zero, E to the minus T over tau plus the EMF. And so that's how I get that shape. This one here has I equals I infinity minus I zero E to the minus T over tau plus I infinity. Well, I infinity, the current that it's going to have after an infinite amount of time when it reaches equilibrium is zero. The current it has initially is the EMF over R, and so I can put those in as well. So that's... And we'll just stick with the RC transit circuit. We won't worry about the, the RL transit circuit. If you can do one, you can do the other. It's just a little different thought. So important parameters. Determine what the voltage is going to be initially, what the current is going to be initially, what the voltage is going to be finally, what the current is going to be finally. Put them in. And keep in mind, the voltage can't jump on that capacitor because the current is not infinite. Infinite current would be necessary to go from zero charge to a big charge. So the voltage can't jump, so the voltage before you flip the switch. By the way, a question I was going to ask. Well, this was always the EMF, right? And before the circuit was closed, this was zero and this was zero volts. So if this has an EMF of, let's say, 10 volts, and this has zero volts, and this is zero volts, how can I use current voltage, voltage law correctly here? There are two answers I can, can give credit for on this. This is assuming that you don't close it. Hmm? This is assuming that you haven't closed it. Yes, before I closed it, yes. One answer, the one that is easier to say, but, but misses what I wanted to think about, is, well, you don't have a circuit because when there's a gap, there's not a closed loop. 
So there's not a circuit, hence Kirchhoff's current law isn't going to apply. But you can say, well, in my mind there's a circuit, but there's this element. What's the voltage drop across this element? If this is 10 volts, this is 0, 0. What's the voltage across this? 10. 10. So the voltage drop was across here before I closed the switch. When I close the switch, the voltage drop here goes to 0. This one stays at 0, so this one had to jump to 10. All right, now to magnetism. So, magnetism in a material like a permanent magnet is caused by magnetic domains. And, oh, that reminds me, did do you guys give me back my magnets? I have them in my room. I've got to ask the people from last year, see what happened to my, my powerful magnets. Um, so, yeah, thanks. So magnets have little magnetic domains, basically like little Martin bar magnets in the material. And normally those things are just randomly oriented. But if you put them in a magnetic field, they can align with the magnetic field because you always have a torque to make magnetic fields align. So if I have something that's iron, I put it in a magnetic field, those little dipoles, the magnetic moments, will align with the external magnetic field, and then I'll have an attraction between the magnets. That's, that's how, well, a compass is a big example of this. The compass is a permanent magnet, and then we have the Earth's magnetic field. And so the compass will then have a torque to align with the Earth's magnetic field, just like those domains have a torque to make them align with the external magnetic field you apply. That's how things have magnetism. There is no such thing as a magnetic monopole. Magnets always come with a north side and a south side. Now, Mira, for one of her scrapbook entries, um, wrote an article. Yeah, I don't know what you guys are doing. Uh, she used a site where they are finding a kind of magnetic monopole, but it's not a magnetic monopole. Something that behaves like a magnetic monopole. As far as we know, magnetic monopoles don't exist. You can't have a north without a south. But what they have is something that has this end is behaving like it's a north alone, this end is behaving like it's a south alone. So each end is behaving like a magnetic molecule. But it's not an actual magnetic molecule. Because I, I was like, what? <laughs> I didn't tell you it's an actual one, it's like it's similar to it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but I was, it totally got me curious. <laughs> so we don't know of any magnetic molecules. In theory, they could exist, just like you have a positive charge exists, a charge molecule. But since we don't know them to exist, as far as you need to know, they always come with a net magnetic charge of zero, with equal amounts of north and south. North means north seeking. So if you put it in the Earth's magnetic field, it'll rotate to seek the north, just that direction. South means south seeking. But opposites attract. So the north seeking is seeking the north pole. So what pole is the north pole? South. Crazy. So magnetic fields, because there's no magnetic monopole, they always form closed loops. They always come back on themselves. And they always leave the north pole of a magnet and enter the south pole. Inside the magnet, of course, they're going from south to north because they're forming a closed loop. Um, and I've already said a lot about the bottom one, so I can just move on. Magnetic field, just like we talked about electric fields on Wednesday, magnetic field is a way of calculating the force due to magnetism. And for our purposes, we never once calculate the force between two magnets. We calculate the force on moving charge in a magnetic field. So you don't have to go figure out how, you know, how do I calculate the force between two magnets. That's just not part of our area. Right hand rule is super important. You had to use it first semester, you had to use it second semester, and here's where. So remember your right hand rule, if you have something A is equal to B cross C, B is the first item in the cross product, C is the second item in the cross product, and A is the answer, right? So you always have your index finger in the direction of the first one, which would be B in this case, middle finger in the direction of the second one, which would be C, and then your thumb is the answer. So the questions we have, or the equations that we have here, our force equals Q 
V cross B. Now I saw Michael working along with me. So Michael, let's see if you, you know, which finger is going to point in the direction of force? Right. Andrew, which finger is going to point in the direction of the velocity? Right. Not just think, you're correct. Leslie, which finger is going to point in the direction of the magnetic field? Oh, sorry, it's the middle. Okay. <laughs> I'm not sure which finger is my B finger. Um, got my pointer. Apparently a ring finger. So you find the directions. The force has to be perpendicular to both the velocity and the magnetic field. So if you have velocity that is parallel to magnetic field, it turns out since you're multiplying perpendicular parts, there is no force. If the velocity is not parallel to the magnetic field, then you're going to have a force. And you just your fingers can go, the middle finger, we say they're all perpendicular. But the middle finger can actually vary from being straight with the index to going to back toward your elbow in the way that your fingers are supposed to bend. There are, I mean, one of my friends died this last year. Terrible thing. Um, but his fingers could do things like this. Don't try to do that when you're doing the right hand rule. Don't hyperextend or anything. You keep it going forward. Okay, so we've got that right hand rule. The magnitude of the force is QVB sine of the angle between the velocity and the magnetic field. So just as with everything this semester, I think, I find the magnitude, QVB sine theta, and I find the direction with the right hand rule, and then I break the components as necessary. Um, okay, now this here was for a charge Q flying a magnetic field. What happens if Q is negative? Opposite direction, because the V cross B is the direction we found with our thumb. If Q is negative, then our force is in the negative thumb direction. We also could have had current going through a wire. In the case of current going through a wire, we used force is equal to I L cross B, where L is the length of the wire that's a vector pointing in the direction the current flows. And you know, it just you so want to put I as the vector because it's the direction that the current flows, but I can't be a direction and L can. So I L cross B, all the same rules apply. So if I have a wire, we next get to Ampere's law. Better said that right. If I have current going through this wire, how do I determine the direction of the magnetic field it creates? Because we learned that magnetic field is created when you have moving charge. How do you determine the direction? Go ahead, Leslie. You just, the, your thumb will go where the current is, and you wrap, <laughs> yeah, you wrap your, these fingers around. Around the wire, it tells you the direction the magnetic field is going around the wire. So you use that right hand rule and you have that it's magnetic field is going like that. What if I have a solenoid? So I have something that's going like this. Well, it's got like, you know, 500 turns here, which will approximate with three. So if the current's going like that, what direction is the magnetic field in the center of the solenoid? Take your right hand, as DJ saying, you wrap your fingers now the direction the current's going, your thumb points the direction of the magnetic field in the center, which is into the screen. So I have, remember, I probably like to put circles around them. Circle with the X means you're looking at the fletchings of an arrow. It's an arrow going away from you. And that's the magnetic field inside, so what's the magnetic field outside going to be? The opposite. The opposite. You just have to remember the outside is the opposite the inside. We focus on the inside because it's strong inside. It's weak outside. That's why we focus on the inside. Ampere's law. If 
Well, Ampere's law is a little, this is the solution for Ampere's law. For a solenoid, it's muat I N over, yeah. N over L, where N is the number of turns, L is the unit length. That's the magnetic field created. How do we get that? Ampere's law says that the, oh, N, well, let's just take off the, the vector sign because we use the right-hand rule to get the direction. Ampere's law says that the circulation times each piece of length is equal to mu ot times the current enclosed. And so applying this to a solenoid where we have N over L terms per unit length, we got that relationship that showed above for the magnetic field. So you should have some understanding about how that is done, especially if you are Tracer Michael. Then we had also the magnetic field that's produced by a wire. If you use Ampere's law and you just go a constant distance R from the center of that wire, you find the magnetic field is equal to mu watt I over, uh, what was it? Two pi R, because that's the circumference. Uh, I think that was correct. I, of course, didn't do any careful work here, so it's going with I think that was correct. Um, it's me. Yes. There. I did the work in my head. It's correct. You, you make a loop that's circle constant radius R. Its circumference is 2 pi R, so the circulation, as we call it, B dot delta L is B times 2 pi R. And it has I enclosed. So those both come from applying Ampere's law. Um, there's one more that only the people in calculus would be considering, and that's at the center of a circle of current, which is slightly different. All right. Faraday's law of induction. Moving into electricity. Okay, so, so we've had that there is a force when we have a charge moving a magnetic field. And then a current creates a magnetic field. And now Faraday's law of induction goes the other way and says that a changing magnetic field will create a current. And so Faraday's law of induction says that the induced voltage on a loop is proportional to the change in flux. Flux being... B dot A. B is the magnetic field. A is the surface area vector, which has its direction normal to the surface. So in short term or short state words, it's the magnetic field going through the surface. So if the magnetic field going through the surface is changing, you're going to have a voltage induced on a loop. So this is applying to a loop. And the minus sign, I've told you, the minus sign reminds us to look at Lentz's law that says that the induced voltage is going to create a current to try to fight the change. It's the resistance. Try to fight the change. So if your magnetic flux is increasing, it's going to create a magnetic field that's opposing the magnetic, the external magnetic field to fight the change. If the magnetic flux is decreasing, it's going to make a current that makes the magnetic field the same direction as the external field to try to keep it the same. So Lenz's law says that it's going to have an induced voltage, which means induced current, if you have resistance, to try to keep the magnetic flux constant. And so eddy currents were an example of that. So were electric generators. Electric generators were taking advantage of this. We take a loop as Andrew did. Who else in your group? Anyone else in this classroom? Uh, no. no. Okay. Well, Michael. Michael. Hey, Michael. Okay. Andrew and Michael, they took a loop and they rotated that loop in a magnetic field. So the flux, the B dot A was constantly changing because the angle between them was changing. Remember, dot products means you're multiplying the parallel parts. So that's B A 
cosine of the angle between the magnetic field and the area to the loop. And so if you rotate this constant rate, then the flux is equal to BA cosine of omega T. And then I take the time dependence of that, how it's changing in time, what we call a derivative. And we have the change in flux over change in time is actually minus omega BA sine of omega T. And so that means the voltage it's producing is equal to minus a minus, which makes it a plus, NBA omega sine of omega T. So that's the equation to tell you, in theory, the voltage they should have been producing. Now, what was the most difficult thing for them? How strong the magnetic field was. Right, their magnetic field was created by six external magnets spaced. If you had a Hall effect probe, you could actually measure what that magnetic field is, and thus they could have gotten a theoretical, this is how much voltage should have been produced. But without that Hall effect probe, which they didn't have access to, they really couldn't find what the magnetic field was that they had there. Now, you could have looked up, you know, what strength do these mags usually produce and gotten a guess. Um, so that's what an electric generator is doing. Transformers, much more than meets the eye, right? What's the purpose of a transformer? Changes in voltages. Okay. Change voltages. Here's how it's made. Piece of magnetic material. Oh, come on, stop that. Like, say, iron. And you wrap two wires around it. This one here, I'm going to put an input voltage in. So I'm going to have, that was supposed to be blue. V in, actually, like this, V in, here. And so if I have a changing voltage, you notice I have this little tilde because it has to be AC. I don't know if you're going to have a light on the test, but if it says you have a DC voltage, you better know. DC voltage, sure, it's going to make a constant magnetic field, but a constant magnetic field doesn't induce anything. It to be changing. So this induced voltage, or this input voltage, excuse me, is causing a changing magnetic field. And this green thing, because it's something like iron that's magnetic, it has magnetic fields then get formed into a loop that stays primarily inside of the iron. And so you have very good coupling of the magnetic field between one coil and the next coil. And then the next coil, because you have a changing magnetic flux, Faraday's law of induction means that it's going to produce an output this is a voltmeter that's measuring V out it's going to produce an output voltage and through work that we will never replicate the voltage in over the voltage out should be equal to the number of turns in over number of turns out. So you have n in is the number of loops you have on the input side, and n out is the number of loops you have on the output side. And for ideal cases, so this blue part of the equation is only ideal, Ideal means if you have no power loss, then you should have, that's also equal to current out over current in. So you have V in, I in, the power in, is equal to V I out, I out, the power out. In a realistic case, of course, 
the eye out is going to be slightly lower because you're going to lose some power. So that's what a transformer, that's how it works. What's the point of the transformer? Okay, I already asked the question, you answered. To change the voltage. We like to use the PET transformers to do things like create voltage at, let's say, 120 volts, and then use a transformer to raise 350,000 volts. Why do we raise at such high voltage? So the current is very low if we have it travel somewhere. And you know the power is the, the voltage times the current. So for a high power with a high voltage, you can have a low current. And the power we lose is proportional to the current squared. So if you lower that current, the amount of power you lose in proportion to your total power becomes really small. So that's why we have the really high voltages for our transmission lines. So we have low power losses, and we achieve that by using a transformer. But then we get on the uses side, I don't want 350,000 volts coming out of the socket here. So we use transformers to step it back down. Another way transformers are used are for isolation. There is no connection between the blue wire and the magenta wire. So that can be used to isolate circuits. You might have had a ground. Remember, ground technically means that you actually have a state going into the ground. In practice, we just use it to meet our reference point. You might have a ground here on the black side, and you don't want that to be the ground on your magenta side. The transformer isolates the two so you can have two different grounds. What kind of voltage must you have for this to do anything useful? What type of voltage must you have for the transformer to do anything useful? Yes, must be alternating. Must be alternating current, AC. Inductors. Inductors, well, a single loop is an inductor. A coil is an inductor. What is inductance? Inductance is you have current going through a loop, and that creates a magnetic field. But if the magnetic field changes, it induces a voltage. And so the current going through the coil creates a voltage drop across the coil. So that means that if I take a coil and I put current in, I'm going to have some relationship between current and voltage. And it turns out V is equal to IX is what we write, where X we call the reactance. It, an inductor is not going to use energy. It will store energy in the form of a magnetic field that it creates. And so then it turns out that X is equal to omega L, where omega is the angular frequency, and L is the inductance. The inductance based on how you create it. And my mind has gone blank. I do not remember the equation for inductance. I truly don't remember that equation. This is sad. It's a sad day for me. But we'll go on. It, there is a physical parameter, just like capacitance. If we went over last class period, capacitance has a physical um, relationship. Similar to that, we do have for a capacitor, V equals IXL, where X is equal to 1 over omega C. So we have reactants. Inductors and capacitors both will react when I put current through them, they will have a voltage that's induced in both, well, yeah, a voltage that's induced in the inductor, a voltage in the capacitor that's caused by the charge. And so they will store energy. So we call this reactants, reactants because it's not taking away energy, it's storing it and we'll give it back. But in circuits, this looks just like Ohm's law. And in fact, we use it like Ohm's law. But remember that they're out of phase. Because with the inductor, your peak voltage is going to occur when you have the fastest change in magnetic field, which is going to be when you're, if it's a sinusoidal input, it's going to be when you're at zero, um, zero current. So zero current produces the highest voltage, a 90 degree phase shift between your voltage curve and your current curve. The capacitor has a similar relationship that it will have a 90 degree shift between the voltage and current, but the capacitor shift is the opposite direction. So we have Eli the Iceman, that's E stands for EMF, L for inductor, 
leads the current. So voltage leads the current for an inductor. Ice, current for a capacitor, and then E for EMF. So in a capacitor, the current leads the voltage. So the current voltage, or the, if you have a constant current going through an inductor and a capacitor, or constant current, an AC current, then the voltages of them are going to be 180 degrees out of phase because one's leading by 90, one's lagging by 90. And so that brings us the phasor diagrams, which, yes, good. I, I was like, I hope I have some more here. The phasor diagrams where we had the resistive part here, the capacitive or inductive part there, and the capacitive part there, as we did in the lab. And Z is the impedance, which is what you get by combining them. Just use the Pythagorean theorem. And there's your impedance equation. And of course, you have Ohm's law, V equals IZ now. That includes both resistors, or all three resistors, inductors, and capacitors. Um, electromagnetic waves. Our transition out of electricity magnetism. As you can see, our review apparently isn't going to get to optics. It's going to end here with the transition to optics. So Maxwell, James Clerk Maxwell, combined a whole bunch of laws of physics to get down to just four. Gauss's law, the one that says that the, <laughs> got to think now, I am thinking, not very effectively, the voltage, wait, no, no that's Faraday's law. Faraday's law is the voltage is proportional to the rate of change of the magnetic flux. Um, Gauss's law says the electric field depends on the charge enclosed. It's the, the electric flux is equal to the charge enclosed um, divided by epsilon zero. Gauss's law for magnetism, which says the same thing for magnetic flux, except for there is no magnetic log pole, hence it's equal to zero. Oh, this clock must be wrong. No, it isn't. I just got carried away. I'm sorry. You got to go. Well, I could have sworn it said 46 after and I had four minutes. <laughs>